This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Watch another full-length exclusive companion video to this one about the Russo-Ukrainian War and the events in Crimea next on Nebula, which you can access by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal for just $15 a year at curiositystream.com/reallifelore. For hundreds of years now, the Russian civilization and state has always struggled with three major geographic nerfs to their playstyle. Most of their land is a completely inhospitable frozen wasteland, which limits their development. Most of their coastline is covered with ice for a majority of the year, which limits their access to the world's oceans. And their borders to the west are on a huge open field that's easy to move soldiers across on either side, which makes them particularly susceptible to invasions coming from the west in Europe. These nerfs are probably going to become lifted. This is how climate change will likely transform Russia once again into a global superpower. For the vast majority of countries in the world, climate change is going to be an absolute disaster by the end of the century. If you draw a line across the planet along the northern borders of the United States and Canada, just about every place south will be a significant loser by the end of the century. This is because human productivity has been found to be at its highest somewhere between an average annual temperature of 11 and 15 degrees Celsius. Any higher or lower, and productivity for civilization begins to decrease. Right now, this zone for maximum human productivity exists across the continental United States, Europe, Anatolia, China, Korea, and Japan, which helps in part to explain why most modern and wealthy civilizations today exist here. But throughout history, this zone for perfect human productivity has been located elsewhere, and in the near future, it's going to change again migrating further north this time. Because of global climate change, by the end of the 21st century, it's believed that this productivity zone will instead stretch across the Arctic through Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Scandinavia, and most significantly, Russia. As a direct result, the economies of the continental United States, Brazil, China, the European Union, and India will all struggle with adapting to this change, while the economies of the Arctic will be given a tremendous once a few thousand years opportunity. And none of them are in a better position geographically to exploit this than Russia. Russia controls by far the largest amount of territory in the Arctic. 53% of the Arctic Ocean's coastline is Russia, and more than half of the Arctic's population lives in Russia. Much of this is taken up by Siberia, Russia's massive and infamously cold Asian territory that accounts for the vast majority of Russia's total land area and roughly 9% of the entire Earth's land area. The average yearly temperature across this region today is just 0.5 degrees Celsius, and includes the coldest permanently inhabited place on the planet here at Oymyakon, where winter temperatures can plunge to as low as negative 71 degrees Celsius, well below the perfect productivity zone temperatures. Largely because of this, Siberia has been under-inhabited for centuries. Only 33 million people live here today, only one-fifth of Russia's total population, and less than the population of Morocco. But Siberia and Russia's north is insanely rich in natural resources and potential. Perhaps even the greatest concentration of resources found anywhere in the world. And the warming climate zone creeping north is presenting Russia with a never-before-possible opportunity to exploit it. It's estimated that there may exist up to $2 trillion worth of completely untapped mineral resources in the Russian Arctic in the form of rare earth elements, zinc, iron ore, silver, nickel, copper, coal, gold, uranium, diamonds, and much more. As global technology has increased, many of these minerals have become the key components for most of our devices, from smartphones and computers to everyday appliances and missiles. As Siberia warms and the demand increases, Russia will be increasingly capable of mining more and more of these resources. But their value is completely eclipsed by the next most valuable resource that'll be found here, oil and gas. And already, Russia is considered to be one of the world's great energy superpowers. 
She possesses the world's largest proven reserves of natural gas and is the world's largest natural gas exporter. She is also the world's second largest oil exporter and the third largest oil producer. But it's specifically natural gas that Russia has historically bet the backbone of its economic and geopolitical future upon. Russia is the largest supplier of natural gas to Europe, with these 12 countries importing more than half of their gas from them alone, and these countries importing further significant amounts. The EU even further imports approximately 30% of their oil from Russia, and Russia exports most of these resources directly to Europe through these 12 pipelines that act almost like arteries delivering blood. And most of the gas that flows through these arteries originates in Russia's Arctic with 85% of it coming from northern west Siberia. Russia's fantastic geographic position enables it to simultaneously supply natural gas directly to both Europe and Asia, which gives it substantial geopolitical pressure to utilize on both continents. The natural gas fields here in western Siberia are believed to be the largest found anywhere on the planet and remain largely unexploited today. With tens of trillions of cubic meters of natural gas, however, the Russians can potentially supply enough energy to power the entire European continent with for decades if ever fully developed, and the warming climate will substantially improve Russia's capability to do so. But arguably even more important than Russia's energy and mineral resources being more exploitable is going to be Russia's increased agricultural potential in a warmer world. The fuel for any civilization or empire throughout history has always been the same, food. And Russia already produces a lot of it. They are the world's largest exporter of wheat, barley, and oats. One fourth of the entire global wheat market comes from Russia alone already. And all of this has simply been by relying on Russia's legacy growing regions here in the south and the west. As the world climate warms and the productivity zone moves further north, much more of Russia's land will open up for even further agricultural production. Estimates published by a team of Russian ecologists in 2019 suggest that if humans continue emitting carbon dioxide at high rates, roughly half of Siberia, or more than 2 million square miles, could become available for farming by 2080, and its human population capacity could jump up to ninefold over what it is today. And once again, Siberia and Russia may potentially exist in the perfect geographic location for the future at the very top of Asia. Asia, the world's most populous continent and the one that will end up having the highest amount of climate refugees fleeing from places further south. If they are willing to in the future, Russia will be in the best position in the entire world to accept millions of climate refugees from the rest of Asia, who could be easily used to settle and populate the vast and currently empty Siberian frontier and transform it into perhaps the world's greatest economic juggernaut of the late 21st century and the early 22nd. And Russia's own current population is also not as susceptible to the effects of climate change as most other countries are going to be. For example, most of the United States' large cities are all located on the coast and are going to be susceptible to the effects of rising sea levels, which, over decades, will probably end up displacing millions of Americans and cost trillions of dollars. Meanwhile, Russia has very few large cities that will be vulnerable to this. Of the top 30 largest cities within Russia, only three of them are located on seas. St. Petersburg, Vladivostok, and Makhachkala. The other 27 are all located further inland, including the capital and biggest city, Moscow, which is over 600 kilometers away from any oceanic body of water. Thus, Russia is going to naturally become the most resilient major country in the world to rising sea levels as well. And much of that has been because of Russia's history. Despite having the fourth longest coastline in the world that's over 50% longer than the coast of the United States, Russia has effectively been landlocked and isolated from the world's oceans for most of her history because most of this long coastline is covered in ice for at least a few months out of the year during the winter. Russia's only continuous ice-free ports year-round are today found in Kaliningrad on the Baltic, 
a few on the Black Sea and Mermainsk up in the north. Until the development of modern icebreaker ships, this meant that, especially during the winter, Russia was always largely landlocked, and even today, Russia only possesses a fleet of 31 icebreakers that can only do so much in so many places. This ice lock curse has prevented Russia from accessing the global oceans and all the benefits that come with it, like trade and power projection, for centuries. But the climate change buff that's coming to Russia this century is all set to finally lift this long historical curse for them once and for all as well. Because the sea ice of the Arctic is beginning to melt and fast. Historically, the Arctic Ocean at the top of our planet is permanently covered in a layer of sea ice even throughout the summer months because it's just so cold up there. In 1979, the level of sea ice in the summer looked just like this. But in the summer of 2012, scientists recorded that the extent of the sea ice coverage here shrank down to just this piddly amount the lowest ever since records began, and in 2019, it was down to this amount, the second lowest recording ever taken. It's been found using this data that Arctic sea ice is decreasing at an alarming rate of nearly 13% per year, and given that trajectory, the Arctic will probably be almost entirely ice-free during most late summers as soon as the 2030s next decade. And once again, this will be a huge boon for Russia because of this, the Northern Sea Route, or NSR. Currently, if a cargo ship wants to transport goods between the busiest port of Asia, Shanghai, and the busiest port of Europe, Rotterdam, the quickest and most efficient way possible is along this route that flows through the Suez Canal and into the Mediterranean, through the Strait of Gibraltar, and across the English Channel. This route is 18,000 kilometers long, and it takes roughly 37 days of travel time to transit. However, ships traveling along the NSR between Shanghai and Rotterdam would only have to end up traveling 10,500 kilometers and would only take 22 days of transit time to get there, saving a distance of 7,500 kilometers and 15 days of travel time over the Suez Canal route. Most of the shipping that goes through the Suez today is trade between China and Europe. So this dramatic decrease in time would save Chinese companies billions of dollars in shipping costs, would render the Suez Canal largely defunct, and reroute nearly all of its traffic along the NSR instead, which is conveniently located entirely within the Russian exclusive economic zone which means that Russia will stand to profit immensely off of it through transit fees, the same way that Egypt is profiting off of the Suez Canal right now. The only problem is that, currently, the NSR is still almost entirely covered in ice for most of the year and requires specialty icebreaker ships to plow through, which is costly and not very economical. But next decade, as the Arctic Ocean sea ice begins to completely disappear in the summer months, this will change and Russia is going to eat Egypt's lunch. China has already seen the writing on the wall and has invested over $200 billion into Russia's Arctic ambitions, which include developing the NSR into a feasible and usable maritime trade route. The NSR is bringing Russia and China together in a natural alliance, since it means both incredible savings for China and increased revenue and geopolitical influence for Russia. But it goes far beyond just trade. The melting of the Arctic sea ice provides another golden opportunity for Russia and China China in the form of submarine, high-speed fiber optic cables. This is a world map displaying the location of every marine internet cable in the world currently. This is literally the internet's and largely the world's nervous system, as these cables make up 95% of all the data and voice traffic between the Earth's continents. You will, however, notice an absence in any direct cables between Europe and Asia, which has always meant that data and voice traffic between these continents have been slow when compared to other continents. The melting of the Arctic sea ice will, however, change this reality forever. Russia, with the assistance of China, intends on laying cables in northern Siberia that will finally bridge the digital gap between Europe and Asia, and even further cementing their geopolitical influence on both continents. On nearly all counts, Russia comes out dramatically ahead in the face of climate change. 
they'll have a dramatically higher capacity for agriculture, they'll be able to sustain a higher population, they'll have access to dramatically more resources in the forms of oil, gas, and natural minerals. They won't need to divert nearly as much money to rise in sea level mitigation, since most of their major cities are located far away from the sea. And perhaps most importantly, their entire coastline will finally be unlocked and usable after centuries of being useless, which will provide them with enormous access to the new warmer world's oceans and new locations to construct their ports upon. Just before Peter the Great's death in 1725, he allegedly made a statement for all of his future successors to Russia. You must always expand towards the Baltic and the Black Sea. These were Peter the Great's primary foreign policy objectives while he was still alive and, to their credit, nearly every Russian ruler ever since has largely followed his guidance up until the modern day, including in 2014, when the Russian army invaded Ukraine and annexed the Crimean Peninsula on the Black Sea. I remember when all of this happened seven years ago now, when I was still in college before I ever even started real life lore. And I knew even then that one day I wanted to create a video detailing and chronicling all of these insane events that I was watching. Unfortunately though, YouTube's policies have effectively prevented me from creating it for years now, because anything about recent or current wars and conflicts aren't allowed to be monetizable. Which means that the moment I ever uploaded this Russo-Ukrainian war video here, it's getting a big fat yellow demonetized symbol immediately and, as a result, YouTube won't place it in your recommended feed and won't show it to you unless you directly search for it. So, instead of going through that hassle here on YouTube, I've decided to upload my 21st Century Crimean War explainer video exclusively to Nebula, which, as you've probably heard by now, is home to tons of exclusive, ad-free content from all of your favorite educational creators beyond just me. The reason that I and others are able to put exclusive companion videos like this one over there is because of the way that Nebula works. It doesn't have an algorithm that punishes us when we create something controversial or something that's different from our regular content, and the direct subscriptions from users help to fund both these and other projects, like our many Nebula originals from people like Sam from Wendover Productions, Tom Scott from a Tom Scott, and many others. So if you're interested in watching all of this awesome exclusive content, plus supporting loads of independent educational creators at the same time, the easiest and cheapest way to sign up right now is by using the CuriosityStream Nebula Bundle deal. All you gotta do is go to curiositystream.com slash real life lore and sign up for any subscription they have. But I'd suggest the yearly one since it's less than $15 a year, and then you have access to both streaming sites. And CuriosityStream itself has fantastic stuff too, like Hidden Russia, a fantastic geographic documentary that'll take you on a complete tour across every region and biome that the biggest country on Earth has to offer. Or Empire of the Tsars, a three-part history documentary chronicling the rise and fall of the Romanov dynasty within the Russian Empire between the 17th and 20th centuries. All told, Curiosity Stream is awesome thanks to their seemingly endless library of top quality stuff, while Nebula is great thanks to its exclusive, early, and ad free videos from the educational creators you already know and love. Curiosity Stream and Nebula together, though, are even better because it's less than $15 a year for both when you go to curiositystream.com slash real life lore or by clicking the link down in the description. It really helps out real life lore a lot if you go and give them both a try. And as always, thank you so much for watching.